so yeah, she she gave him a son and th- left the stage basically. And I remember you saying you had a few points you wanted to make about the two years. Because after his- yes, because after Jane Seymour died, they started looking for another uh, wife for him. So Henry was a widower for two years. It was believed he was actually uh, grieving for her, so he basically dove into a uh, his gluttony of both women and food, which is when, by the time Anna Cleves came, he was obese. Because <laughs> leg injury meant he couldn't compete anymore, so he couldn't exercise, So he's, and he still had his appetite, so by the time she came in, he was obese and actually believed to have... Uh, already contracted type 2 diabetes. Not surprising, really. I mean, I mean, a lot of, I mean, if you ever look at the diet of rulers, most of what they ate was 10 plus meat dishes every meal, bread, and fruit. They <sighs> ate no veggies unless they were in stews or meat pies. And even then, it was probably mostly root vegetables. Yeah. Which aren't the healthiest. No. Because I know, like, Which, when I make stews and stuff, it's, like, potatoes and carrots and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And... Which leads us into wife number four, Anne of Cleves. Ah, yes. And as I mentioned, I'm currently showing the famous House of Holbein portrait <laughs> that Henry had commissioned of her as he was finally choosing... He agreed to have his marriage arranged for the sake of politics, and one thing about that is that since they were no longer a part of the Catholic Church, they had lost alliances with a lot of kingdoms that still were a part of the Church. And so they yeah. had to form an alliance with someone who wasn't, which led them yeah. to... And at this time period, the only uh, places where non-Catholics, uh, well, besides Jews, of course, uh, where non-Catholicism was a uh, a thing was a um, uh, Germany because I believe the a um, uh, Luther Lutheran movement was still in a uh, it was either still in its infant, infancy or it was well rooted and German princes were allowed to pick their religions. Yeah, and the Reformation, as it's called. With. I mean, I mean, the Reformation started with Martin Luther, but it really, really didn't take off until later in the uh, 16th century. Yeah, and even in the musical, I was a little surprised that they make these... There's several references to Luther and the Reformation, which just well, seems... I think, well, it's going to be... I'm going to interrupt on that and point out one of the great ironies of history that still goes on today. One of the titles of the current Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, is Defender of the Faith. (laughs) That title came because Henry VIII condemned Martin Luther. Really? Yes. um, I don't remember which incident he was, but Henry condemned him. I don't remember what it was again. And so the Pope, and they were still Catholic, and it was still during his marriage, so the Pope gave him the title Defender of the Faith. And the English monarchs had kept it ever since. See, now one thing I did see was that Henry was actually fairly a devout Catholic. In fact, in, in all seriousness, once they, uh, they split away from the church, nothing really changed. The only thing that changed was Henry was in charge. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and so Anne of Cleves was a German princess, and Henry commissioned the artist Hans Holbein, to do portraits of her and her sister and was very firm about make sure it's an accurate depiction so I know what I'm getting into. Um, Henry, let, let's not talk about your pics, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but So it, from this, he selected Anne of Cleves, who was by all accounts a very polite, gentle-mannered woman. She, I am. Mean, she probably would have been a really good queen if Henry could stand her. But I think part of the the issue going in is he still had some kind of a fondness for Jane Seymour. So yeah, and it's maybe, almost like, 
it's almost like there was still a hole in his uh, heart and Amicleaves just couldn't fill it. That's an interesting thought. Because by all accounts, the picture is very accurate. Like, most people are like, yeah, it, it looks just like her from what I've read and such. And it's a pretty picture. <laughs> I mean, most people in their portraits don't look very good, in my opinion, from back then. And she was this very polite, refined, I believe one word I saw was serene and collected. Which is one thing that really frustrates me in the musical, because they make her this total... I still can't even think of the word. Thought? Not, not quite. They, they make her very <laughs> crass. And, uh, by the way, I, I never thought I would hear the phrase, and my jam comes on the loot. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, yeah, again, reason the reason I was glad I did not listen to the musical, because I probably would have just thrown something. Like, <laughs> that's not how it went. Yeah, and it, it's just so frustrating, because it's like... So, yeah, they make her very... I'm gonna go have a party, because I ain't married. And this is a woman who... At, and again, I think the references to Lutheranism and the Reformation in her song are extremely ironic. Because, like we were talking about earlier, this is a woman who knew which way the wind was blowing. Because... <laughs> She was the only one who survived to Mary Tudor's coronation. And as soon as Mary took the throne, she's basically going, you know, Catholicism isn't all that bad because she knew what Mary was going to do. <laughs> we'll get to it eventually, but. Yeah. So, but. She... And of Cleves, basically, Anne of Cleves came and went. Yeah. Henry didn't really like her too much. And then. Those feelings were like, it's like he was just, yeah, I didn't like you coming in. I really don't like you. Let's just part ways before I part your head. <laughs> yeah. And of course, there is um, the story that the first time he met, they met, he decided to play a trick on her, basically, disguising himself as a peasant, running into the room where she was. And I believe she was watching a tournament through the window. And so she was kind of distracted watching it. And he comes in and kisses her in disguise. And... Apparently, she's like, oh, thank you. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not happy about this. And like I said when we were talking, that is the most courtly love game I've ever <laughs> heard of. It's like, if, if you needed... Yeah, if you that needed, would make sense. Yeah. And so he wasn't happy that she she didn't respond to him. And I will say this, though. I will say this. He was actually quite generous with the annulment. I mean, she got a good settlement. Definitely. She she got her own palace. And yeah. she, and she became and, and they became pretty good they were good friends after uh afterwards and she also she was also really good friends with uh his two daughters. Mm -hmm. Which I think I'm not sure if it was her or if it was Jane, but I think she kind of uh uh, I don't know if it was her or Jane, okay, but... Okay, Jane was the two. one who got the girls re-legitimized. Okay, that's who it was. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, it was Jane. Yeah. That's one, one thing I forgot, so... Anna Cleves came and went, and as a result, Thomas Cromwell, his most trusted advisor, lost his head for it. The man who was responsible for taking Anne Boleyn's head. Gotta love yeah. it. <laughs> Again, history is full of karma. <laughs> And now, even as Henry was working on his annulment to Anne of Cleves, he had his eye was caught by a certain lady in waiting in her retinue, which was Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard. And I have to say, of all the women in this story, Catherine's is possibly the most tragic, in my opinion. Yeah, she was just, she was just a victim almost her whole life. Pretty much. So she she came from a noble family, but her father was one of like 11 children or something. So he really didn't inherit much. And, no. and then he went on to have five or six children. And so they were incredibly poor. And then when her mother died, she 
Anne, or Catherine, sorry, it's hard to keep track of all the names. Catherine was sent to live with a wealthy family member who was a dowager duchess of somewhere. <laughs> it's like, I know the name, but I also mix it up with another. It's easy to uh, mix up names. Yeah. I, I, I want to say Kirkland, but I also used to live somewhere near a place called Kirkland, so I may be mixing it up. What was uh, his name? Who's? The who who she lived with. It was, like a fun. it was a dowager duchess. Oh, a dowager duchess? Yeah. Norfolk. Norfolk. Okay. So she was sent to live with a relation in Norfolk who also took in a lot of children from poor relatives. And thing is, the Dowager Duchess herself was almost always away at court, so all the children got neglected, and the girls would allow men into their dormitories because the men would bribe them with wine and food and other gifts, which uh, is not good for any girl to do. Just never let a boy into your bedroom. Terrible idea. <laughs> So, I'm not going to make any comments on that. <laughs> so, yeah, and so Catherine Howard, it's when she was 13, she was being taken, taken advantage of by her music teacher. I am going to try and keep the language somewhat clean in this case, just in case my channel ever gets monetized. <laughs> and... So she she grew up in this situation where these girls are being bribed by these men and clearly taken advantage of, and so she thought that was normal. And she was being taken advantage of by her music teacher when she was 13, and then by the Dowager Duchess's secretary. And I believe the secretary actually wanted to marry her, or it may have been another guy. There are uh, reports that they had some kind of agreement. Uh, his, by the way, his name was uh, Francis Derham, and he was a secretary. Yes. They became, they became lovers, called each other husband and wife, even if it was just as cute nicknames. But <laughs> it is a that's a name to remember because it led to both their downfalls. Yeah, and but it was also the music teacher, I believe, who reported their engagement so to speak to the dowager duchess because he didn't like this guy swooping in and taking right. his toy basically mm -hmm. and so the secretary was sent away though he promised he would come back and marry her i believe he was sent to ireland that's with what that promise. i i think so yeah that's what i recall and somehow, Catherine Howard, who was also cousins to both Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour, round, wound up in Anne of Cleves' retinue as a lady-in-waiting. Uh, that was because her uh, uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, uh, got a place in court in the household of a uh, Anne of Cleves. So that's, was, that was her in. That makes sense. And so that's when she caught Henry's eye, and she was only 17 at the time. 16 or 17, 16 or 17 is the common uh, ages, I see. Yeah. And so she's still a teenager, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, she was gorgeous. I mean, around that time, that was pretty common for them to a. Uh, well, actually, that was a little late for uh, them to be married at that time, but <laughs> she was still a teenager. Yeah. Not so much about her um, body. <sighs> God, how do I say this? We're talking about her mental state as a teenager, not it, anything else. Yeah. And, you know, again, she grew up very neglected, and I think that definitely had an effect. Honestly, I think she was a casual flirt. Just because... Yeah, that's, that, I, I believe that. Yeah. And I don't think she meant anything by it, because, you know, I mean, you know me, I'm a... I'm a casual flirt in a way. I mean, I flirt with you all the time. And you know I don't mean any... Huh? I was just laughing. <laughs> yeah. And you know I don't mean anything by it. It's just kind of how I communicate. And, yeah. and I think she was very much kind of the same way. Just because 
that was kind of how she was taught to interact. Mm -hmm. And and I have a feeling that's something Henry really liked about her because he was getting older. He was like you said he was, he was 49. Yeah, he, he was, was 49. He was 49. He was already obese at this point. And here's oh, diabetic pretty much lame because his leg was ulcerous. Yeah. And he I think he saw this pretty fun cheerful girl and she made him feel and she probably flirted with him casually and it made him feel good about himself i imagine and i think that's part of what drew him to howard mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately that was not to last no i mean Sure, um, I believe it was the same day Cromwell was executed, they were married. I think so, yeah. And then the, it was a secret, it was another private ceremony, and then the public one was on, it was a month later, I believe. Yeah. And, oh, so something I did want to say is, so after they were married, you know, I mentioned when I was talking about Anne Boleyn that she was the most expensive of the queens and that Catherine Howard was the second, but that I think it was very different because I think it Anne... was, uh, that would be more uh, Henry gave her so much. I mean, Henry basically spoiled her. Oh yeah. It, and I think part of it is just that Anne, I think Anne was more mature in that she, she liked the finer things in life. And I think with Catherine Howard, it was just this very child. I just imagine her being really childish. Not, I definitely can see that. Not in a bad way, just that she she never matured. And I don't mean not she had like a friend. mental handicap. Just she just wasn't. A, she didn't have the environment in which she could mature. And exactly. So I imagine well. her being very childlike. And so then she gets this situation where Henry is like will tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. And she's like, oh, well, I want this and this and this and this. And she did bring back the French fashions, which <laughs> had been driven out after Anne's death. And mm -hmm. just all these luxurious dresses and they went on this extended honeymoon and Henry completely remodeled a castle. <laughs> and by all reports, he was happy with her. And like I said, I think it was just that she made him feel alive again in a way. And, but like I said, it wasn't to last. Yeah, because unfortunately, her flirting caught the attention of a uh, Thomas Coupler, I think his name was. Who was... I believe was also a distant cousin of hers. And uh, one of Henry's uh, favorite courtiers. Uh, so yeah. he had, so this wasn't just some random guy. This was a guy with a position of power in the court. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say power, but important position. Yeah. It, so she, she they basically find... cheated on Henry with one of his best friends. More or less. Yeah. That's still it's again it's allegations which of course on the male were brought under torture. I know that uh I know Catherine confessed to it, but she also claimed that Durham raped her instead of being seduced. So True. It's hard to believe her. Yeah. And Another thing about why I believe she is, you know, she and Anne, Anne of Anne Boleyn are the two wives that were beheaded, but they were very different in that because, like I said, Anne went to her execution like, you know what? It's over. I'm done. There's nothing I can do anymore. I lost the game. See ya, Henry. Bye. And Catherine Howard, on the other hand, was terrified. And this is a girl who spent, she had the executioner's block brought to her cell the night before her execution and spent hours practicing how to properly lay her head on it. And I have to admit, I almost want to cry every time I hear that. Just because- Like I, I said, she was always, like I said, she was more of a victim than anything else. Exactly. Victim of her upbringing and a victim of the game. She just, she had no chance to mature, basically. Yeah, and I think while Anne knew the game she was playing, I don't think Catherine had any idea what she was getting into. No, she did not. Yeah, so like I said, I think they're the opposite in that sense. And so... 
there were the accusations of the affair, and there was enough proof that... There were uh, letters. I mean, I believe Coupler called her a sweet little fool, which was a compliment, but also <laughs> fitting for her. Which I think does also kind of prove everything I'm trying to say about her being... Yeah. A and very then, childlike. And well, and well, obviously, Henry remembered his friendship because Coupler was beheaded, whereas Durham was hanged, drawn, and quartered. <laughs> like I said, uh, medieval executions. And they don't even rival the ancient ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, looking at you, Greeks. <laughs> oh, not even just Greeks. I'm looking at Persians and Babylonians. True. So... Which leads us on to Catherine Parr, yes. the final Yeah. Who the musical calls the one who survived, but, I, I mean... Well, I mean, if you look at it, she survived her marriage all the way through to Henry's death. Yes, so and she survived true. Henry. So, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I do actually like her song in the musical. It's one of my favorites, where she's talking about, you know, I, I wish I could tell Henry I don't want to do this, but I can't say that to the king. And... She she also goes into this thing. She's like, why do I have to tell my story to Henry? Why with Henry? Why can't I talk about the fact that I was a writer and I advocated for female education? And I'm kind of like, well, why didn't you lead with that musical? <laughs> so, I have many questions. <laughs> I, I'm sure we'll discuss them later. <laughs> so yeah, Probably. Catherine Parr. Now, we discussed that Jane Seymour was the one who re-legitimized Mary and Elizabeth Tudor because after the end of Henry's Mary marriages to their mothers, he, he declared them illegitimate and wrote them off as bastards for one reason or another. And well, I mean, their marriage they, before, that was more or less reason enough to write them off as bastards. Of course. And so Jane Seymour was the one who got them re-legitimized and brought back to court. Catherine Parr was the one who actually got them returned into the line of succession. And he basically, basically was, she basically reconciled Henry with his daughters fully, not just the line of succession. Yeah. And, you know, for that, I have to give her props. Now, for a while, I was kind of saying, eh, she's my least favorite because of the allegations of her uh we'll get to that let's cover the marriage first and then we'll briefly discuss the afterwards sure although i mean their marriage was well i wouldn't even say it was the best marriage but she survived that tells you everything you need to know <laughs> she was she was very much a good queen like catherine of aragon again the catherines <laughs> Yeah, and she, and even she was even able to talk her way out of a plot. <laughs> like there were uh, two men, I believe they were uh, a bishop and a duke, were did not like her religious views, so they tried to convince Henry to have her arrested. But Catherine was able to talk it out with Henry and reconcile, therefore avoiding the arrest. See now. My research showed that it was actually Henry who got annoyed with her discussing her Protestantism so often. And he was like, no, shut up, and wrote up an arrest warrant. But she came to him and was like, no, 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 I wasn't trying to tell you what to think. I wasn't trying to, you know, I wasn't trying to tell you you were wrong. I was coming to you to ask your opinion so I could learn from you. Which, honestly, when I think about it, that sounds like the best way to talk anything out with Henry, is just be like... Which makes total sense, I mean, considering his personality, but... Yeah. I mean... Yeah, yeah. so, but I, I've heard it both ways, that it was other people and that it was Henry himself. But she was, she was very intelligent. She'd been widowed twice before, and... Something we were talking about earlier again, because we, we talked way too much before we started the <laughs> recording. Um, Anne of Cleves, after the divorce, and once she learned to speak English, because she didn't speak English when she first arrived in England, 
once she, after the divorce, she and Henry became friends. And I think it was the first time Henry was ever introduced to the concept that he could just be friends with a woman. And that it was possible to have a friendship there without any sexual aspect or romantic aspect to it even. And I think that's actually what led to him choosing Catherine Parr as his sixth wife. Because obviously Howard was right after Cleves, so there wasn't time for them to have that friendship. But then it's after he's friends with Cleves, he chooses Catherine Parr, who was more mature, and she was a little older, and she was a widow, and they, she was a writer, and she did advocate for fem female education. And she... Sorry, I'm trying to find the right words. And so she was a very intelligent woman. Which confused me at first, because she wasn't really Henry's type looking back at it. But I think after his friendship with Anne of Cleves, he realized, oh, and he was getting older, so it's possible that he was infirm at this point. And I think he was just like, I want a friend. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Not so much in those words. That's a bit simplifying. But I think he wanted a companion in which makes, more I mean, than which just I, the bedroom. I totally agree. Which I totally agree with. Poor Henry, by that point, was pretty much in pain every day. So just any form of comfort or friendship was enough. Yeah. And Catherine would also nurse his injuries. and Well, not injuries, but the ulcers and everything. She would nurse his leg, essentially. And that's something I don't really see any of the others being willing to do. Right. So she she took care of him, basically. And at that point in his life, I think that's what he needed. Yeah, and well, as I, sa as I said, she was able to talk her way out of being deposed. Yeah. Well, well, being deposed and arrested, which could have went through any number of things, but she would be the one to survive him. Yeah. And after his death... Um, so she had actually been on the verge of becoming engaged before she caught Henry's eye. and To a uh, Thomas Seymour, I believe? Yes. Yeah, because he was a cousin of Jane Seymour. And she did marry him afterwards. Now, there is some controversy with, I believe it was said that he actually tried to marry Elizabeth Tudor before... He went back to Catherine Parr. I've heard it both ways that it was before and after, but I think it was... I'm kind of going with the before, because Elizabeth sent back a letter saying, no, thank you, I'm going to be in mourning for my father for the next two years. Because this was just, like, months or less than that after Henry's death. Yeah. And Elizabeth ended up living with Catherine Parr, and... Thomas Seymour, and there are allegations that he did abuse her. And I've not, I've not found anything to confirm, to confirm or deny those. So I'm just gonna let you go on it. Yeah, um, I'm not really gonna go into detail. At first, for a while, I was like, I don't like Catherine Parr because apparently she overlooked this. But like you said, there's really no proof of the allegations. Really, the only person who reported it was Elizabeth's maid or governess or companion at the time. And that was during an investigation into Thomas uh, Seymour because they, uh, there was definitely a proposal from him to Elizabeth. And so there was a, a trial, basically. Did he commit treason or whatever by trying to marry Elizabeth without the council's uh, permission or something like that. But, yeah, there's... He was, he was beheaded for treason, but I'm no, not sure if it was that one right there. Yeah, and I didn't go too much into that, but over, over the last couple weeks as I've been working through all of it, basically, I've come to the conclusion that I... From everything I've seen about Catherine Parr, I don't think she would overlook that. So I think there is some kind of... There's something more there that we'll probably never know the answer to. Which is one of the most frustrating things for me about history. Because I want all the answers. And I want to know what happened and what was this person thinking and all that. And it's like, there's no way to know. 
Well, that's one of the uh, great a uh, great issues with uh, being a historian is you find all, you get all these questions, but you cannot find all the answers. Yeah, and I, obviously, I I have theories about a lot of things, and I come to my own conclusions, which I think was why I was a great fan fiction writer. <laughs> Just as a side <laughs> note. Um, but I do have all these theories, and I've even talked about them with you and here in this video. It's just, yeah, there's certain things well, that I just get an impression, probably, so I go with my we gut. Probably, we should probably save those theories for another time then, or this video will be three hours long. Definitely. Yeah, no, I wasn't going mean, to go into it. I think we've already been at this for an hour and a half. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, um, so one thing, so part of why I wanted to do this video is because apparently the musical has this overarching plot of the reason all the wives are talking about this and each doing a song is to determine who had the worst time of it with Henry. And I'm like, they don't come to a conclusion because they insist instead all the girls are going to become friends, which they're not. Ah. <laughs> girls that don't like, work quite like that. I don't understand. I mean, I mean Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour basically hate each other. Why would they come to that conclusion? Yeah, no. But, so, I wanted to do my own run. I, I spent an entire day at work thinking, okay, who actually had it worse? And so, really quick, I wanted to go through our grading of who we think had it worst, and then we will quickly discuss the three children. Mm-hmm. So let's, should we start off with the least then and work our way up? Yes, and now here is actually a small discrepancy in our two grading, because I noticed you put Anne of Cleves, because obviously you sent me the list the other day of how you graded them, and you put Jane Seymour, or you, you put Anne of Cleves last as having it the easiest, but you put Jane Seymour above her. And I'm a little curious as to why, because I got the feeling that, uh, I mean, I, it's mostly kind of a thing. It's like, it's something I haven't mentioned, but I've heard this, but I've not found no confirmation. I can't find the source in which I heard it from, but I heard that Henry could silence Jane Seymour if she ever talked up by saying, remember Anne Boleyn. Okay, I have heard that. I think she spoke up asking for mercy for some Catholic rebels or something. And he basically said, remember what happened to your predecessor. So, Which I think is, that's kind of why I put her more in the middle, because, I mean, I don't know if he ever did that again, but that kind of, I don't know, almost mental abuse kind of thing? Definitely. Okay, yeah, I will go with that. So the last one we have is Anne of Cleves. And I think... I mean, she well, came in, she left... Nothing really happened. Yeah. What and, else can be said about that? Yeah, and even in the musical, it's like, your song isn't even about him. It's about how cool your life was afterwards. You were insulted. Move on. <laughs> Basically. And, and, and in all reality, she actually didn't feel insulted. She like, yeah, I agree to this moment for this reason. Yeah. And so then we have Jane Seymour. Catherine Oh. Well, just to go up the list. I thought, so, okay, sorry. I thought we put uh, Catherine Parr above Anne Cleves. My bad. Or, we did. No, I'm sorry. We got a bit mixed up. So I just want to go. Okay. okay. So Cleves is last. She had it the easiest. Then we have Jane Seymour, who there may have been some mental abuse there. And then Catherine Parr. And who then, pretty much had the, Catherine Parr, who had the dodge one plot. Whoopity doopity do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And by all accounts, she actually could deal with him uh, and even respond back to, uh, well, not respond back, but deal with him in a way. She could hold her own, yeah. Yeah. And then it was. So this brings us up to Howard and Aragon. Aragorn. I definitely believe. Um, I believe Howard did not have it as bad as Catherine when it comes to Henry. I mean, Catherine's life before Henry, that was awful. But with Henry, she spoiled, oh, not she, he spoiled her and she cheated on him. Definitely. I agree with that. And I put her there because while Henry could have easily just divorced her and been done with it, no, he had her executed. Yeah. And 
Catherine of Aragorn was at least allowed to live. She was, yeah. I mean, but I put her at number two because their marriage went on for so long and it got so ugly at the end trying to get that divorce that he basically split the church in two. Yeah. And, but the last one leads us to Anne Boleyn. And, you know, when we first started discussing this, the line I came up with and that I'm still pretty proud of is basically Anne played the Game of Thrones and she lost. Yeah, not just lost, but goddamn, her name got slandered at the end. Oh, yeah. And here's the thing. So you remember I said I discovered her through this little kid's book. Well, eight or nine, ten <laughs> book of about Elizabeth. And they actually talked about, I, I guess they couldn't figure out how to sanitize the whole adultery incest accusation. So they went with the whole witchcraft accusation yeah. and it wasn't until years later i found out the witchcraft accusation didn't come about until years later and was completely fabricated by the catholic church because if yep. she had actually had six fingers or anything else indicating that she was possibly a witch Which... she never would have been allowed near the king She's... she wouldn't even been allowed to come. she wouldn't even been allowed to live past 20 she would have been like drawn up uh, before when they found out Exactly, and she never would have been in the Queen's retinue. So, Which, by the way, by the way, one of those uh, allegations was supposedly a third nipple. <laughs> oh gosh, I didn't know that one. I heard that from a freaking documentary when I was 12. <laughs> the things that stick with you. <laughs> I, I, oh, I could make some jokes about that one, but I'll pass. <laughs> So, yeah, the, the accusations of witchcraft came years later, and I'm very frustrated with that book, because it's like, I really liked you, and you lied to me. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah, and I think Anne went into the game knowing what she was doing. and She went in knowing, and knowing the consequences if she failed. Yeah, but I also think she didn't account for Henry's personality clashing with her own. And I also don't think it ever even crossed her mind that she wouldn't have a boy. I am sure, because especially since she was still fairly young. She was in her early 20s going into this. And she's like, of course I'm going to give him a son. I'm going to be queen. I'll give him a son. Everything will be fine. And then she can't. <laughs> And she starts to panic, which is going to make her even more of a bitch, frank frankly. And she's mm. going to be giving Henry a harder time. He's going to pull away more. She's going to try and drag him back to her. And, and then she's going to lose her head. Yeah, and ultimately she got in, I was going to say over her head, but she got in right at head neck level for a French swordsman. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and ultimately it came down to she played a game and she lost control. Yeah. So, running it up from bottom, from least to worst, we have yes. Anne of Cleans. Um, was it Catherine or Jane? Uh, number Jane. five. Jane, Jane number Seymour. Five. Catherine Parr. Jeff, Catherine Howard. God damn the Catherines. Catherine of Aragon. And then finally Anne Boleyn. And see, when I, originally I was going to do this video on my own, and I ran through that, like I said, I spent all day at work one day just going through this of determining who was, who had it worst. And I kept coming back to Anne Boleyn. And I'm like, is this just because she's my favorite and I'm biased? And then I came to Anvil on my lunch break, and I'm like... So, what do you think? And he agreed with me that it was Anne Boleyn. And like I said, slandered. Uh, basically, all the charges were trumped up and lies. But as I told her a long time ago, you'll confess to anything under torture, especially back then. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not the same, Anne. Anne wasn't, but before anyone assumes so, Anne was not tortured. It was the men accused of sleeping her with her will. With her were. <laughs> Yeah. 
So really quick, let's go over Henry's legacy and the three children who get glossed over in the musical, which I'm really tired of legacies being glossed over in the musicals. So well, let's... to be fair, coming on to the first one, Edward the Fourth, wasn't much to say about him. It... Most of his ruling was done by regents and advisors. Yeah, and he was only 15 when he died, I believe. He was. Now, he did try to block his, his half-sister Mary from taking the throne because he knew she would try to reinstate Catholicism. And so he actually named a successor. But Mary... The 15-day queen. Yeah. Mary I was... Do not remember, I do not remember her name, but I know that she was very young, pretty, so it was easy to put her into the role. And she only lasted 15 days before until Mary rode in and took her birthright and then had her beheaded. <laughs> and now Mary, Mary is a bit of a victim, I will confess. Victim slash mental illness case. It's that, but I also think some of it is the fact that she did in... Okay, so we have the fact that when, when Henry annulled his marriage to Catherine of Aragorn, he separated her <laughs> from her daughter. They were not allowed to see each other. They were not allowed to exchange letters. They were denied any connection. And of course, he cast Mary off as a bastard and sent her away from court. Now, there was some interaction between Mary and Anne Boleyn during which it's reported that Anne Boleyn was quite cruel to her. Like I said, I said that I like her. I never said she was good <laughs> or perfect. And yeah, I know. And so we have this culmination that Mary clung to. She also believed that Anne poisoned her mother. Now it it's believed now that Catherine of Aragorn died of stomach cancer. And that's why her it stomach was cancer. I believe, yeah, it was a cancer of some type. I yeah. thought it was breast cancer, but, I do, it was either, but yeah, it might have been stomach or cervical. Yeah, because her, her stomach was black. And so some people thought that meant she had been poisoned and that Anne had done it. But it, it, nowadays it's believed to have been stomach cancer. But Mary clung to this idea that Anne was a heretic, basically, and that her she and her mother had been robbed of their birthright. And so it's all that and the resentment she built up, and she, she very much embraced the Catholic faith, which she got she from She basically her... turned borderline fanatical, honestly. Definitely. And I think it's a mix of what she inherited from her father, both in genetics and possible mental illness, and also just his ruthless way of ruling in some mm -hmm. cases. The irony is that we don't know much about Edward because he was so young, but Mary and Elizabeth were the children who were very much like their father, and they definitely they took after him. Yeah, I was explaining this earlier to, uh, before we even recorded this video, but Mary and Elizabeth were two sides of the same coin representing Henry Tudor. They just got different sides to him. Yeah. Mary got the madness, and Elizabeth got the ability to rule and to be a good ruler. And she essentially, well, we won't get there yet. So Mary, when she took the throne, not only beheading the person who was the named successor by Edward, she sought to reinstate Catholicism, except she did so in a very brutal way. Anvil, I believe you said there were 300 people or more that were burned at the stake? The number I always see is 300, but who knows who else she also had executed via various manners, but the 300 burned Protestants is the uh, most common number. And also remember this, she only ruled for five years. Yeah. And she had 300 people burned. If you average that out, that's 60 people burned in a year. So, yeah, Mary... And there's a reason her nickname is Mary Bloody Mary. 
which I find the biggest irony in history. She's nicknamed Bloody Mary, but it's because she burned people at the stake. <laughs> I did always find that a bit interesting. And I remember, I think it's the, oh my gosh, I can never remember her name. The actress who played Galadriel in The Lord of the Rings and Valka and How to Train Your Dragon. Oh, God, I know who you're talking about. Now I can't even remember her name. <laughs> well, she she did two movies where she was Elizabeth the I remember. Them. And the first one opens with Mary basically conducting. I don't know if she's. It was, it was uh, well, she never, she rarely, she never really attended them. Yeah. It was just. Uh, but it's this scene where Protestants are being burned as a witch and you see their heads being. Well, no, 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 no. It's burned as a witch. Not, it's not burned as a witch. It's just burned for being heresy. Okay. Look, uh, witches I, were never, witches were not burned in England. They were hanged. Okay, I was 11, and the only <laughs> time I had ever heard of people being burned at the stake before this was Joan of Arc. Yeah. So, forgive me for... So, a bunch of Protestants were being burned for heresy or I'd whatever. Say, I know. I'd say, I know the scene you're talking about. I've seen it. Yeah, I figured you would. And but so... yeah, that was, actually, that was actually a pretty accurate representation of how those burnings went, is most of the time, they didn't have enough wood to burn them. So the burnings would take a long time, actually, and let's just say it leaves a nasty smell in all the buildings nearby. I'll bet, yeah. And so I don't think I even watched the scene all the way. My grandfather was watching the movie, and so I was I, I was curious because it was Elizabeth, and then I saw that, and I'm like, you know what, I'm leaving the room now. So, <laughs> yeah, and Mary was... Mary was a piece of work, but she was a victim of circumstance in many ways. Yeah, and, and, and her marriage, too. I mean, she was married to a Spanish prince. I can't remember his name. It was either Philip or Charles. But when they married, he was 18. She was 33. Oh, gosh. So it was not a good marriage. She was so desperate for her child that she had several fake-out pregnancies, basically. Yeah. Eventually, it actually, poor Mary, it actually turned into a joke at one point with some of the commoners saying she was going to give birth to a monkey or something along those lines. Well, when you keep executing people, people are not going to like you very much. It, yeah. That's kind of how it goes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Mary was a, she was still a vicious ruler. I mean, 300 people burning the stake is no laughing matter or going to get you sympathy points, but... That's pretty much how she's remembered. Yeah, and I think I think it's easier looking back on history where we can see all these details about her being abused and separated from her mother, and especially as much as we understand psychology now, we have a greater grasp of how that's going to affect someone. But Mary's reign, once it finally ended and she died, and it wasn't even an overthrow, she just died. I but, think it was a cancer of some. I think it was like her mother. She had cancer. I believe so. But so she finally died. And despite her attempts to um, get a, get rid of Elizabeth, <laughs> because she really did try. I think she even had Elizabeth thrown in the tower at one point. She did, yeah. Yeah. So, but Mary eventually died. And Elizabeth I took the throne. And here is the greatest irony in this whole story. So, like when I said... When Anne was pregnant and given the crown, she was pregnant with Elizabeth I, who would later become one of England's greatest monarchs. Are you really stealing my line? Yes. <laughs> so... Henry spent all these years trying to have a son who would be his legacy, who would be his heir. And in this, he completely disregarded his daughters. You, you know what? Disregarding Mary, eh, okay, bad idea for her psychology, good idea for what actually ha for what ended up happening. But with Elizabeth, this is the daughter who was the most like him in some of the bad ways, but also in some of the best. And she also tried to balance it. She knew her father's flaws, and she tried not to repeat them. 
she went on to be one of the greatest monarchs England has ever had. But honestly, all the world has ever seen. Pretty much. And the saddest there's part. Why, there's a reason why when anyone ever thinks of good monarchs, Elizabeth is one of the first up there. Yeah. And well, I didn't want to be too. I didn't want to exaggerate too much. <laughs> so, so she is everything Henry could possibly have wanted in an heir, in a successor, in his legacy. The thing is, so one of the things he wanted was to secure the Tudor dynasty because they hadn't been, they hadn't held the throne for very long, as I recall. Just a few generations, and so you want to keep your family in it. But because of what he did to Anne Boleyn, because of what he did to other wives, Elizabeth refused to marry. And as such, a great queen as she was, the Tudor dynasty died with her. Yep. Which, as we've said, it's the greatest irony of the whole story. It's all the predictions that she would be a boy. If you think about it, what they could have meant in some the riddle of the stars or whatever is that this is the heir the one who would be henry's legacy and who would rule who would be a great monarch and would preserve henry's name essentially in some ways i mean obviously the six wives thing has made him pretty famous but that might not be such a big deal if we didn't have elizabeth following him and so in a way the predictions of oh it's going to be a boy kind of came true in that she was henry's successor and she was yeah. a great ruler but oh yeah because of how she was born the circumstances of her birth being a woman she was written off until the time actually came. And again, yep. the dynasty died with her because of Henry's actions. Yep. Leading to the Stuarts, which are a whole mess on themselves. <laughs> and by the way, if you ever want to see what some of the stuff that happened in the Stuart line, watch Gunpowder Plot on HBO. It isn't. Is that the one with Kit Harrington? Yes, who was a <laughs> descendant of Robert Catsby. Okay. Yeah, I know I know that one's typical, like, HBO violence, so I haven't really looked into that one beyond just knowing what it is. So I mean, I'm just, if I'm being serious, uh, there's not too much violence in it. It's just when the violence shows up, it's, yeah, HBO violence. I don't trust you. <laughs> I've watched the whole series. It's really damn good, actually. No. I don't trust you because you told me the same thing about Marco Polo, and I am still mentally scarred from that. <laughs> I okay. Hey, I actually warned you this time about HB about the gunpowder plot being violent. <laughs> I didn't think to warn you of Marco Polo was my problem. You specifically told me, oh, it's not as bad as Game of Thrones, which I guess it's not as bad as Game of Thrones. I, there's just a couple scenes that stick out in my mind where I'm like, oh my god, ah, I'm, ne I'm never recovering from that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so do you have any final notes or final thoughts? Um, not really, honestly. I think I've said all I could say about this without going on for a two-hour lecture. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't mind that too much, but we should try to limit the video. Well, I mean, let's be real. Most people, I mean, most people are going to probably watch it in parts. True. Yeah, this but is this is my channel. I know, I know, I know. It's just, yeah. even for someone like me to get through all this in one sitting will be hard, so. Yeah, well, I think I might actually break it up into sections. Well, considering how much I cut out, that's a pretty <laughs> good place. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. I had a lot of fun. And oh, I did, too. We're going to have to do these calls more often. This was fun. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really enjoyed this. And obviously, I love getting to talk to you about history. So. Oh, I can go off about history for a long time. <laughs> well, we may have to take advantage of that in the future. Anyway, well, I'm about to find a subject to cover. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Definitely. Well, 
thank you everyone for listening. Like I said, this will probably be divided into a couple sections. Uh, at the very least, I can do two videos with three wives in each and maybe do the wrap up separately. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. If you are interested, Anvil does gaming streams almost weekly, almost over on his YouTube channel, The Anvil of I Gaming. I will be doing a Destiny 2 stream tomorrow. Sweet. Well, this video isn't going to be up tomorrow. Uh, I'm it. <laughs> sorry, but I will share your link like I usually do, I promise. And also, his channel link will be down in the description along with links to my social media. Although I'm not showing any of my art in this stream, so you should go check out my social media to see my art. Anyway, thank you again for it's listening. Worth your time, trust me. Also, go to her Ko-Fi and donate to her. She needs a new laptop. <laughs> Thank you. I... Aw. You're a sweetheart when you want to be. <laughs> all right. Well, I will see all of you, or some of you at least, in my next video. And Anvil, I will... Well, we're either going to stay on the line a little bit, or at the very least, I'll see you in text messages. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.